um, I thought the kind of investigation they're doing requires secrecy, right? They had to be quiet about it. <laughs> but after three years, I told them I cannot be quiet about it. I naturally think- Hey, it's Kellen. And today, you guys, in from a treat, all the way from New England, I have Dr. Anne Marie Adams, the founder of the Hartford Guardian, Black-owned publication. We love those. And she's out of New England. So you know I'm going to go revisit- my New England roots where my wife and I got married and talked to her all about just how she started the Hartford Guardian and also about how she has a connection or her family inspired the Cosby show. You guys are in for a treat. Welcome, Dr. Anne Marie Adams. I got to throw the doctor on because you just never know. Everyone loves titles nowadays. <laughs> yeah, I earned it. <laughs> You earned you earned it, and you know we, we're gonna go go from there. So if that gets annoying, my my wife uh, gets annoyed. She says, "Don't call me that unless you know you're paying me." So um, I'm gonna stay <laughs> with that title, <laughs> but <laughs> unless you check me otherwise. But how are you doing? I'm doing fine. My voice is not the same, so um, you forgive me on that. Okay. No worries. And, and folks, if you're listening where the majority of the audience is and you say, hey, she sounds muffled. She is masked up. She is protecting herself from the over 300,000 people and counting who have died. So she's protecting herself in the home office. So that's why it sounds like that. Bear with it. The game will still flow. And where should we start? I, I want to start really on how you started and why you started, you know, your publication. Okay, um, I'd like to start with the uh, origin of my publication in which, um, you know, I, I was a spelling bee champion in elementary school. And in high school, I, I sharpened my writing skills. And one of my English teacher liked my writing and told me to stand up to read to the class. Ever since then, I got the bug for writing. Hello? Yeah, I hear you. And so I went to college at Brooklyn, Brooklyn College and I became editor, news editor of the Excelsior. And then months later, I became editor in chief of the, the Kingsman. So it's there I actually became a media executive where I am um, supervised at least seven staff members and um, you know navigated the ethnic and racial politics on campus in Brooklyn, New York. Not long, not long after, I, um, someone approached me to work at the Times Herald Record and um, I did well there. I was a star reporter on the government and education beat. And I've been on those beats since then, since 1999. Awesome. Right, awesome. So, right, so that was New York, but my family is in Connecticut in the greater Hartford area. So when I was looking for another job, someone else approached me to work for the Hartford Current. As you know, the Current is the oldest uh, publication, news publication in the nation. And uh, they recently closed their offices. And uh, we are the, um, we still have our office, um, you know, at the state capitol. We work from the state capitol, work out of the state capitol because we cover city hall, the state capitol, and more recently, I covered the White House under Bush and Bush two and the Obama administrations. So um, today I'm in my home office with uh, two people because we have been working from home since 2013. Uh, our office uh, was vandalized on Main Street and um, the office on Main Street is where we uh, we usually do uh, different kinds of recordings and interviews over prospective um, 
uh, cl uh, clients, as well as our featured stories of people we're fe featuring in the community. So that's basically how we started. We started as a nonprofit organization in 2004. However, the concept of doing a nonprofit hyper local news publication began in 2002. We got our 501c3 from the Internal Revenue Services in 2005. Now, that's the origin with our board of directors and our seven staff members. So because it's a nonprofit organization, we have been getting a steady stream of volunteers throughout the years. Um, in January, we will be celebrating 17 years as a hyper-local nonprofit news publication. Congratulations. And, and I also have to say all her links will be in the description box for that because a lot of times, you know, Black uh, publications get stigmatized. Oh, I don't want to see a whole bunch of obituaries. I can promise you, you're not going to see that. You're going to see real news on her website that you can use and be informed. And, and I love that because, you know, I, I lived in Springfield. My wife and I, we got we got married out there. Oh. And I know. And I know, you know, the, the point of view in the Hearst family and, you know, what New England black media has that I'll say a lot of the South is lacking is it's it's not just full of obituaries, but I understand knowing the folks who own these you know publications they say well the funeral homes and the churches are the only ones who you know want to give us money a lot of times on a consistent so how did you you know avoid just filling your publication with you know church ads and obituaries how did i um you want to know how, how did i fill it in no, how did you avoid not having that? Just, you know, or were you at all concerned about, I don't want to just fill it with death and, you know, church bulletins. I want to really do real news Be because news is, it it's it's difficult. Um, you know, it's not just, I'm going to write a story and put it out. I, even though you're nonprofit, there's some part of funding that you need. And so I'm just wondering, was, were you at all, you know, was that all an issue? Like, we're not just going to do what we've seen in the past? Well, um, the funding formula for our publication was decided on the experiences I had as a reporter at the Hartford Current. I was closer to the community. I lived in Hartford. I lived in the West End of Hartford on Owen Street. And I would walk around the neighborhood at times and hear issues going on they would tell me about their issues. So basically what I decided to do is to rest on people who are interested in building communities through civic journalism. It's high quality journalism that not only write about the issues, but formulated the solutions to those issues. And we've been doing it for almost 17 years. Some people might say it's like a, a movement of journalists who some traditional, I wouldn't even use the word traditional, it's like a social movement organization to um, advocate for the voiceless and attack social inequality by telling, telling these very um, interesting stories in the community. From a hyper local perspective, we think we um, have impact on the state wide uh, level as well as the national level. Hence, the invitation to uh, by someone to who said, "Dr. Adams would like you to cover the White House. Would like you to cover the Obama administration. We would like you to tell his story." So in 2013, I did a good job of covering President Obama when he came to uh, West Hartford and then to um, you know, Central Community State College 
in New Britain. So because of my coverage, I was invited by some of his men in the Obama administration. So on that journey, I was there until 2015 in the Brady Room with Josh Ernest covering uh, news out of Washington, DC. I was a member of the National Press Club at that time and the National Association of Black Journalists um, member. And I attended a couple of SPJ meetings in Washington, DC. So in 2008, I, um, I had the opportunity as well to cover Obama on ABC News 7 in Washington, DC. And uh, years later in 2014, someone came to my home and told me that I was the one who first king Obama. And I, I was like, really? Is that true? <laughs> and they said, yeah, they did the research. The New York Times pinpoint the moment when the, um, Obama start, started to rise in the, um, in the election campaign. And so I was, a, I was ecstatic and that gave me incentive to go to the White House to cover the, the uh, Obama administration. Well, wow, how exciting to, you know, to have that um, only if there was some type of a trophy or certificate. A lot of times journalists, you know, it's always behind the scene. The, the credit that you get is non non-existent except what you can put on paper. And it's hard to do that just about yourself. But I'm glad that we got that story. How do you find, you know, good talent to groom? I, I remember being in college uh, decades ago and, you know, writing for publications and folks would always say, how do you get to do that? And we're in the South where it's, you know, it, it, it's less, I'll say, um, publications, especially by black uh, writers. So how, how do you find good talent? And what do you think about the current talent coming out of the HBCUs? Um, are, are folks coming with the skills that are needed to be, um, you know, quality journalists? Well, that's a good question. Um, I get a variety of interns here at the Horford Guardian. And I usually get them from the state colleges. But when I was in the district, I, I have a communications consultant arm of the Horford Guardian. For those people who want, you know, to get uh, my background and how I started and just get advice on starting their own news publication. So I had two students from Howard University. Um, I was at Howard University between 2004 and 2000, uh, 2010. So I, uh, I got to uh, mentor at least two students who helped me with Social Impact 2.0. I worked with the embassies. I worked with the World Bank. And uh, I also groomed them to do uh, interaction with, you know, the National Press Club, the World Bank, the United Nations, and, um, you know, the White House. Um, so they were very sharp reporters and I kept an eye on them to see what they're doing over the years, to see if they are, have parlayed that kind of experience into the newsrooms. I must say that getting into the newsrooms is even more difficult. And many of the students do not have internships that give them a variety of experiences such as mine. Um, from those internships, I always look to that pool to hire uh, freelancers or part-time part reporters. So I would encourage the HBCUs to send in their applications to editor at the hartfordguardian.com. We are hyperlocal. We cover mostly the city of Hartford. So that entails getting experience on uh, the city hall beat. That also entails getting experience at the state capitol. Those kinds of experiences are rare for interns or students in college. So I urge HBC HBCU students uh, especially from Howard, because there's a, a local talent um, 
pool of HEC students here in Hartford, I encourage them, even if they're not interested in a career in journalism, to find um, uh, a beat they might be interested in. We have, we not only have interns in doing reporting and writing, we have interns we need to be like interns with our sales manager. In terms of publishing, we can use interns on, on that. We also have the business arm of the, uh, the Hartford Guardian. And uh, there are many things they can use their skill set to help uh, a nonprofit organization such as ours. The fact that we've been around almost 17 years speaks volumes to the quality of journalism we have been putting out in the community. And the longevity of being the first should be um, a bonus for those who are, are interns with us, we think. Oh, no, that's great. You know, one thing about getting older people is when she gives this information, me being able to have friends now who are professors or in those positions to say, here's the opportunity. Because a lot of times folks say, well, where's the opportunity? But sometimes they just don't know where to look. You know, they have all the um, they have the recipe, but they don't have the ingredients. So now that I can send that information in this interview to my friends who are professors and, you know, provosts and all that good stuff, it's a good thing to get older. So with that, let, let you know, you're Connecticut. I, when I read them from the your publicist, how your family inspired the Cosby show. I was like, oh, wow, this is a story we've never heard because a lot of times people think things are just made up and, you know, they just fly out of thin air. But can you talk about that story and really connect the dots for the, the audience who this will be their first time hearing it? Well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, I was surprised. I'm a very, we have a very close knit family. And I think someone was observing us and uh, they came to me because I'm the reporter in the family. I understand they came to my nieces and brothers and sisters as well. So they recognized the similarities in how we look um, on the air. And I, I, I would urge you to show the picture of how we look and how the cast, the cast of characters were pulled together because I said, really? I don't believe that. And they say, yeah, really. Bill Cosby is your father. They have the same complexion. And uh, my older sister, Marcia, is uh, doubled as my mother and sister in the show because she has long uh, mixed hair, right? To her shoulder and below. And Claire mm -hmm. does her hairstyle and she dresses like my sister when she was going to her business in, in Jamaica. We are from Jamaica. When we've been here so long, people think we are Americans. Right, right. So we're like, we are born in America. We are American citizen. So in telling us the story, they identified me as Denise Hustle. And uh, we put out the pictures of why they show Denise Hustle like that. And, um, my sister is Vanessa and my brother is Theo. That's the immediate family. When my niece, nieces are born, Janelle, she plays Rudy um, uh, sometimes as well. So, and then my younger niece is my, um, you know, my daughter, so, so to speak in the show, but because I'm very close to her, they position her as um, the daughter of Denise Hustle. And uh, Mr. Kendall is actually my boyfriend that usually visits my home with my mother and father and talk to us. And then they featured other friends of mine in the show. They feature like, um, there's several friends that they've ID'd and it was exciting. One of them was in the White House and uh, that's how I got to be invited to cover the White House. That's the relationship someone in the White House explained to me. Clearly, because we're hyper-local and our budget is not as large as we like to be, um, I wouldn't have the, the resources to know this and do this kind of research. 
So the investigators are the one who actually led me along so that I believe it and advocate on my family's behalf because it's an incredible story and it must be told. So it took a while before they decided to tell that story. They took, first they observed since I was at Howard University, I'd say about five years. Then they came to my home to tell me about the Cosby Show because at that time they were investigating Bill Cosby and they probably investigate everyone in my family to see if Bill Cosby made contact with us at all. Apparently when we came to America, he was supposed to make contact with the family and do a few preliminaries because of the issue of life skills. If you're basing, if you have, if you have a story concept and it's based on a family, another human being, you are obligated to uh, ID the family that inspired your characters, like Aaron Brockovich. Are you familiar with that? I am. Right. So Bill Cosby and his colleagues and NBC and their cohorts fail to identify the uh, family publicly publicly failed to identify the family that inspired the Cosby show. So that will incense many uh, law enforcement officers, that incensed many prosecutors. They were livid and they came to show, um, show me that it's imperative that I put my life aside. I was gonna get married. I was gonna have a baby and they used up about six years of my time to tell me about The Cosby Show, the spinoff, A Different World, and the other spinoff, which is That's So Raven, based on my niece who they had to move out of the state um, to be protected, they say, because of the hate and the bias that came from locals during the investigation. One of the things they were doing after they ID'd us was distorting our pictures. <laughs> um, then they would darken my photos and they would do Photoshop to change the shape of my eye and my nose. And it was very disturbing because all of that came after I was ID'd as the character called Denise Hospital, right? So they even have something on my the top of my mouth to change the way I speak. So I call for them to end the investigation and get rid of the rogue police officers that don't want me to claim the show. I don't know what kind of devices they're using sometimes. And because they came to me in a professional manner and because I was at the White House, I thought they would be professional throughout the investigation. That has not been the case and now, I have to go public to tell people that um, they want to change the plans that were put in place during the Obama administration to make sure uh, people, people around Bill Cosby know that this is the family that inspired the show. Now, I do not, I've already contacted Bill Cosby via snail mail. So we have done all the due diligence. It's, it was a very tedious process to make sure Bill Cosby is contacted, to make sure um, NBC is contacted, and to make sure the State Department is contacted. So this investigation, which began with me being invited to the State Department, me being invited to the White House, means the White House and the State Department must now come to the fore to put out a press release on the nature of the investigation that requires them to go into my memory with some kind of high tech device and um, go into my memory to see if the, the scenes that I pointed out were actually tr true. According to them, they did not want to ask me questions. They say, oh, did you do this? Did you do that? 
they wanted to use their high-tech devices or unorthodox devices to go into my memory to see if the goldfish that they featured in the, sh in the show was actually mine. They wanted to see if the way uh, Denise cut her hair was actually true. They verified that. They verified the goldfish. They verified the relationship that was featured on the air, the relationship between my sister and I. I'm light skin, she's like milk chocolate. I'm like light caramel between olive and, um, you know, caramel. My complexion falls there and my sister is milk chocolate and she has a very pretty smile. Like we all have the same kind of smile. What I've discovered is that uh, as they were doing the investigation, they wanted to change filters on photos, change the complexion in photos. And uh, I would be on the air and I see that there's like something to change my color to say that I'm not the character. So that's what we have to break up now uh, so that other people are arrested. Some people have lost their jobs because of their bias. And uh, one of those people is attorney Gail Hardy. And uh, there's also the chief state's attorney, Kevin Kane. Both individuals were doing the investigation or watching others from DC do the investigation. Another person who was brought in or was watching the investigation was uh, Pedro Cigars, who was running for his other term as mayor and his communication person, uh, Shelly Sinlet. Yeah, so their effort in trying to put something in my voice to change the nature of my voice uh, is to um, discredit uh, the claim. But what is good for me is that I used to live in Jamaica. So therefore everyone who knew me as a spelling bee champion at my school, St. John's Primary, would know I look like the pictures I use of Denise Lisa Bonet, being made to use, mean being made to look like me. So everyone in my class would know that's how I look. Also, everyone in my my teaching group honors class at St. Jude's would know that's why I look. Everyone in my honors class at Brooklyn College would know how I look. Therefore, I did not understand why they were changing my pictures, why they continue to change my pictures. It defied logic that if those people already know how I look and I deem me as the character on the show, I did not understand why someone like Pedro Cigar, former mayor of Hartford, Pedro Cigar, working with Shelly Zillin, allowed them to use unorthodox devices to continue to change my physique and my face. One of the things they were doing is uh, recruiting locals such as Langley Giles or uh, Chandra Barlow or Janice Fleming uh, or Tiffany Coaster to come here to continue investigating, to continue using uh, social media, to continue using email account to continue reaching out from this office instead of getting um, using the state attorney's office, which should handle this kind of hate crime. So it's now a federal investigation? No, they've been investigating since 2014. They've verified all the matters and they've put out all the stories and it parlays into other stories. So um, my family and I would like them to leave us alone now, now that they've ID'd us as the family that inspired the Cosby show. And just to be clear, you're not asking for any money. You didn't start this investigation. This has all been brought to your attention, correct? Correct, correct, yeah. Okay. I, I just wanna, ma I wanna make that clear because someone will say, Oh, so, you know, they'll think, oh, this is a conspiracy theorist the same way when predictive text and how Google knows what you're thinking and that type of stuff can, you know, be proven because they have the software, you know. And so when you you're typing something that you were talking about, even without Alexa, you know, Google and others 
search engines know. I just want to be clear. She's not asking for money, which I think that that should be a given. I mean, NBC should write a check if they've done that investigation, my opinion, not hers. Um, but, you know, just you know, go deep, go deeper into that, how they even approached you because you weren't looking for this. You were just living your life. Correct. I was teaching at Rutgers University and uh, I was teaching a seminar on race and education. Right. And um, I was approached <laughs> in the reception and they took a picture and distorted my picture <laughs> because they saw that I was look I looked like a semblance of Lisa Bonet on the Cosby show. And it should be pointed out that she had to get like fillers to have her lip looking like mine and her nose looking like mine. So when they started to change my lip, I had to document what they were doing on an orthodox device. And that's how come I was approached by someone who was watching the perpetrators trying to accost me or change my face and my voice and my hair texture. So I wanted to know what was going on. So it all started with my throat, something in my throat, to change the, my voice. So I had a speaking engagement and I had to go to the doctor to find out what was in my larynx that made my voice sound different than how people are used to hearing me. So in, in the course of asking these questions, I was approached with um, high-tech surveillance devices, very important, which is why I wanted, I asked them what kind of devices are you using? I'm in the process of writing my first scholarly book. I have to teach at Rutgers. And then they said, we'll show you at the end of the investigation what kind of devices we're using. So one of the devices, they call it a mind reader, <laughs> right? Or a mind crawler, which goes into your memory. It goes through your air <laughs> and into your memory to find out things about you without asking you anything, right? So it's, um, I went to Washington DC to speak to uh, the FBI about this kind of devices and which department in the State Department uh, uses these kinds of devices because the investigators didn't reveal who they were. But I felt uncomfortable that they were watching me in my home you know, when I'm in my bathroom or in my bed, bedroom. So um, it's called Mind Crawler. The other is called a Spy Demon, <laughs> right? Mm. And I got to see what it looks like. So I was excited about the investigation at first. It was like, whoa, spy detective kind of series. They walked me through layered investigation, layered reporting, and uh, it required um high order thinking skills to keep up with what they were doing in in terms of using sharp critical thinking skills and deductive reasoning to decipher certain things and respond intuitively uh to questions to know whether or not uh someone is telling the truth so that was clearly formal and it was clearly professional so i wasn't expecting any compensation, but we, I am expecting recognition for my mother and father, at least, for raising me the way I am and my family so that it inspired the Cosby Show. So that's our demand that we are recognized properly for inspiring that Cosby Show and making Bill Cosby famous Lisa Bonet and all of them famous and getting money while we did not. I mean, that's the least NBC and other creators can do. The creators and producers who own the copyright are Marcy Carsey. So, I mean, because the show has been on the air for like 30 years, I wasn't thinking I had a lawsuit because it's 30 years and they just started investigating Bill Cosby. It's during the investigation of Bill Cosby, the idea of suing became current because they're claiming copyright. Um, they own the copyright, they said. 
what they're saying they do is own our, how we look <laughs> and how we behave as well, which I thought was really odd that a company uh, can own someone's life rights just like that. So it became complicated and other people were giving legal advice. Um, local lawyers are tipped in to give legal advice. They're also responsible to report the crime at this point. It turned into a crime after Carsey Warner, uh, after Carsey Warner reached out to BBC, uh, a television company that uh, used some kind of theme song in the Cosby show without written permission. And I'm thinking, because we're from a Commonwealth area, London re did that to tell Carsey Warner that they know about the family that inspired the Cosby show. And Carsey Warner is being mimicked because they did not get life rights. They did not get consent to put our images on the air. Changing our images doesn't change the fact that we looked, we were born that way and we looked that way in the 1980s. What bothered them is that we still look that way. And based on sight, you can claim that uh, all the characters have someone looking like uh, us in the family, including my brother Lloyd. So that's what triggered the question about money. Right now, I'm looking for recognition that my family uh, is a good Christian family and they inspired that show. That's the least he could have done. And because he was into other brouhaha, we didn't get to sit down with Bill Cosby to talk about what transpired and why he did not reach out to the family. Here's what's evident. All the things he said about the show and the origins of the show applies to me and my family, every thing. What is different is that he put his own spin on it and he included uh, scenes from uh, his family. Of course, he eventually did that and had to because he didn't have access to us all the time. So he eventually had to include his stand-up comedy routine and he eventually had to include what happens in his family and in America where he lives in Philadelphia. However, because the original series, at least the first two series was solely, mostly based on us, we are thinking we should get partial credit for inspiring that show. And so, and just to give, you know, some folks, if you're still tuning in, because some folks will say, oh, I don't believe this. This is that that conspiracy talk. You know, you're not the first person to say that a show has taken their life. Um, I remember talking to Ron Newt, uh, who said and he was suing Empire for a billion dollars. And he proved how he told Terrence Howard about, you know, his life. And he told the producers prior to them making that show. And he and he's no longer, he died at 69 and he was a street guy, but that doesn't, you know, it's, he still had the proof and others who would vouch for that, who were there at that meeting. Did you guys ever get to meet Bill Cosby or know that, you know, maybe a family friend who was, you know, connected with both of you was able to, you know, document parts of your life. Okay, well, um, no, we were kept clueless. We would just notice that sometimes certain things were strange, like the picture wouldn't look like how we look in person. <laughs> Those strange things over the years were explained by someone called who called himself Pedro Segarra. <laughs> so I, I asked them to come to my office and meet me in person or drop documents off. According to them, they can't do it because um, they're federal workers, they're government workers. And they're like, um, they're just feeding me these news tips. Like, um, yeah, yeah, they can't, um, they just want to be anonymous and feed the information. And I'm saying, because you're not doing this, it seems like 
you want to be like Ed Snowden, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something similar to that. So they have, they said they have to go to another country because you're talking about big time studio executives who will power in politics, uh, government and politics and can uh, destroy their lives. So what Marcy Carsey did is actually put her life in danger by exposing how we look to Americans in America before we got here. That's what Marcy Carsey did. They exposed our lives, <laughs> our look, our way of being, our way of talking. Now, Lisa Bonet is still dressing like me. <laughs> I must say that. And I, it sounds ridiculous sometimes, but if you look at her carefully, when she had the, the locks, I had braids that length. And everyone, most people in the journalism department know, know that's how I look. In fact, someone came to me with one of those devices and told me that we think they're darkening your pictures in Connecticut <laughs> because uh, you came to New York the other day and you did not look as light as you look. And they forced me in a hospital and someone injected something into me and want to paint a picture. I've documented all the pictures they have changed to distort my image. Uh, my name is spelled A-N, not with an E, uh, space Marie, M-A-R-I-E, uh, Adams, A-D-A-M-S, and sometimes it's used a hyphen, but never E. I, I never use my um, name with an E, the N with an E. So those kinds of distortions have been going on lately to prevent me from filing a lawsuit. I, I, I like a 250K lawsuit, much less a billion dollar lawsuit. But it's very clear to me that they owe us money if they violated life rights uh, agreements, okay? They're obligated to meet with us as we were born, not to change her, her lips or nose or eyes or eyebrows or or hair texture with whatever high-tech devices and uh, medicines they have after they force us in the hospital. What I watched my family go through in the last six years is being forced into hospital. My sister, who's very pretty, I was forced in the hospital several times after being induced with sugar and salt. Um, I found out through the investigation, that's what they did. Now, do you at all worry about your safety because you're talking about, you know, um, people doing an investigation, they're not identifying themselves. Um, that's that's a real thing, folks. This is not just the movies. Uh, sometimes art imitates life and vice versa. But I mean, you're dealing with high profile people who, you know, they can pull out anything and when they can't get anything, they pull out taxes and said you paid too much or you paid too late um, or paid too little. So do you worry about that? Yes, I do. I, because they presented themselves as whistleblowers, um, I thought the kind of investigation they're doing requires secrecy, right? They had to be quiet about it. <laughs> but after three years, I told them I cannot be quiet about it. I'm naturally thin. I'm uh, 5'7", 125, 135 pounds or 40 pounds, the most. So when someone wants to keep me in secret, in secret and wants to buy food so that I eat starch and sugar like that I watch my sister eat to gain weight, it means it calls for national and international attention. The mere attempt to change my physique says that they're bothered that uh, I look like the character. So this is tied to me being in danger because Lisa Bonet presented herself as someone who looks like me. And she wasn't born that way. I actually gathered all the old photos of Lisa Bonet. All the old photos of me were burned in a fire. And I also learned during the investigation that that's the danger they put us in. When, they cre when Bill Cosby and others sat there, watched us with surveillance technique, I guess he learned it from the show, I Spy, 
right? He was on the show, I Spy, and I guess he learned it from that show, how to spy on other people. So he watched us, conceived the story, put our images on it, or cast people who look close to us, right? We're not, ex we don't look exactly alike, but there's similarities, um, such as my father's uh, Afro-Latino, Lisa Bonner is Afro-Latino. So that makes us with the black people with those heritage. Because we were born in Jamaica, we call ourselves West Indians, no matter what our heritage is. Our heritage is based on location mostly, and we're in the West Indies. So sometimes we can be called Caribbean Americans, um, but we're West Indian Americans and we're naturalized citizens. However, by putting our image on the show, by coming with the investigation, by IDing us as the family that inspired the show, they put us in danger for people who are out of green, want money, or Lisa Bonet who wants to be cast all the time, looking somewhat like me. What she has to do now is present herself as she is now and change that image that she had on the Cosby show. She, um, the spinoff of a different world occurred and then she went on the air with braids, okay, or twisted locks. And she's still wearing twisted locks, but it's similar to the braids and how I used to um, wear my braids. I had to change my look uh, slightly with the wig. And because I was on the show with a, a movie set with uh, Halle Berry, um, uh, Halle Berry had um, plastic surgery to kind of sort of look close to what I look like. So I don't have a claim against um, Lisa Bonet, but I heard that she was a part of the investigation. She was also watching the investigation. So we don't want to put multiple people as suspects, but I, I know that it's tied to her on based on how I look and the fact that she wants to go back in the movie business, she wants to go back on the air. And because, I, and so did Halle Berry. And because they based their look on how I was presented on the air, they do not want me to be visible. So this um, investigation was sent to the Connecticut State's Attorney's Office just this morning because and they told them they have to wrap up the investigation they can no longer act as whistleblowers when the family is being put in harm's way continuously. We are required to have security from the state. The security team, the police officers, were assigned to us to watch and protect. They're not protecting us anymore. They're watching us and harming us in secret. And they subjected themselves to bribes. So we are definitely being a... Uh, prodded and probed in our bodies and in our backgrounds now. And uh, other people who are, who are privy to the investigation in 2014 are now coming forward with letters of affidavits to support what the findings about the Cosby show. So the first thing we did to warn Cosby and his publicists that we should not be harmed in any way because of this cover-up. Also, what they must do is reveal the investigation or the investigators in Philly who is responsible for coming here <laughs> and using someone like John Boehner to be a part of this investigation. If John Boehner was watching me because I was a White House correspondent, he should have put out what he was observing and he did not. If, um, if they're investigating Obama, they should have also put out that they're investigating Obama. If they're investigating Governor Malloy or Pedro Segarra, all men that I've covered before, they should have put out a press release. They have put out a bulletin or memo to other departments about who is shepherding this investigation who the uh, project managers are and who are the people allowed to access my memory with a mind crawler or a spy demon. And uh, so far they haven't. So the danger is there. 
and we are going to be talking about that danger and who keeps coming into my home office, my home to disrupt me during my sleep and to change my face and body because Lisa Bonet wants to be on the acting scene again or because they're looking to suppress the result of the investigation. Wow, you guys, we're, at, we're, we're, we're chiming in. I could go deeper and deeper, but I'm going to actually um, let this interview go and we're gonna see how it flows into 2021 because there's definitely more I could go on. For time's sake though, Dr. Adams, what with all the success that you are having in which it sounds like you have a whole movie and series coming up, what is a community give back that you are doing or that you want to do in the future? Okay, the community give back is one big thing. I mean, being a nonprofit journalist um, is also giving back to your time because it's not as lucrative. That is one. So in terms of telling stories, the community give back usually comes in resolutions or bills or in the general assembly that help to enhance um, programs in the Hartford, the city of Hartford. So that's the give back, making sure the voice of the voices is heard. I don't represent everyone and that is very clear to um, other people. Uh, I can't represent anyone. I'm not an elected official even though people want me to run for office. But I'm just a journalist and a historian, a history professor. So I'd rather stick with those and uh, give back by making sure I'm an advocate uh, and be a voice for the voiceless. Right now, um, the give back also comes with telling the story about Tupac. My first romance was with Tupac and I'm seeing a different side of Tupac being presented. It's important that people know that Tupac and I dated on the set of Juice and that he gave, he gave me some intimate uh, knowledge about what was going on with him before he died. It's important that people know how he died uh, based on what he told me. So uh, someone asked me to do a documentary on Tupac and myself to talk about how he died and how it impacted the community, the black, the entire black community and how he died. There's a kerfuffle about Biggie Smalls, but there are other layers underneath how Tupac died. I think the hip hop community needs to know this so that they can protect themselves and not end, it, uh, end up like Tupac. So that's my give back uh, going forward in the 2021. Wow, you guys have got the game. You know what? A great storyteller always leaves you hanging for more. And so we'll have to get more. Uh, we're going to take the conversation offline. I'm going to talk to Dr. Adams. You guys have been blessed. Her links will be in the description box so you can connect. But wait for the book. And, and I think, you know, it's a scholarly book, she said. But I see even like some film coming up. I mean, the documentary. I'm gonna bug her about it. I might have it on a reminder. So okay. you guys, <laughs> yeah. So, so like, share, subscribe. Thank you, Dr. Adams for coming on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.